Welcome again. My name is Asaf. I'm a member of Combats of Peace. I have been for the past uh, more than a decade, decade uh, now. And uh, with all of you guys, I as well was watching the, the memorial, the Israeli-Palestinian memorial just now online. And like you guys, I uh, am overwhelmed by all the stories I've heard. And uh, this room is intended to give place to some of that. And also uh, we will host two very dear friends of ours um, uh, to help us um, uh, hold that session. Um, one is uh, Suleiman El Khatib, who is uh, uh, the co-founder and former director of Combats for Peace. He's also the co-author of a new book called In This Place Together, which would be released just actually today was released on April 13. And also we have with us Stephen, Up uh, Stephen Epcon, who is a filmmaker and social entrepreneur. He is the director and producer of Disturbing the Peace, which tells the story of Combats for Peace. He's also a co-founder of Reconsider, which is a nonprofit organization that creates media and experiences to shift consciousness around some of our toughest social issues. Welcome, Steve. Welcome, Suli. Uh, before I hand the, the microphone to you guys, I have an important request from all of our guests. Please, uh, you are warmly invited to share whatever it is you are feeling right now, just ending the, the ceremony, just after watching the ceremony. Uh, please allow yourself to write in the chat um, whatever thoughts and feelings uh, you have. Uh, and with your permission, I would read some of them to, to share with, with the room. Uh, you're invited to, to write where you're from, because our assumption is that people who joined the English speaking room are not necessarily from Israel or Palestine. Please share. And while you're starting doing that, I would uh, ask our guests to uh, also begin by saying a few words about uh, their thoughts and feelings after uh, watching the ceremony. Um, Suli, would you like to begin by saying a few words? Uh, do you hear me? Asaf, just to make sure the sound is good. Loud and clear. Okay, thank you Asaf and thanks everybody for being with us tonight. And thanks Steve for joining us from New York. I'm, uh, Really excited to reunite again with Steve since the movie we've been uh, together a lot actually. And I'm still also in an emotional state after watching the ceremony from afar because I had Corona myself. So I couldn't uh, join physically in Bejala, our team, our people there. Um, yes, I'm still uh, really emotional and also thinking uh, how like a crazy idea, like 15, 16 years ago of a few crazy revolutionary uh, small group of people can turn something really big and huge and wide and uh, well known in the world. So this really makes me proud to be part of this uh, historical step for historical change. And that's also a proof that um, active citizen can really change the world and we don't have to live uh, by the task of the system. So I'm uh, glad to be here and also to hear the feelings and the voices of people that uh, joining us tonight. Really, thank you. Steve. Thanks, Suli and Asaf. Thanks for having me. Um, I think it was good that there was a, a period of time between the end of the ceremony and the beginning of this session, uh, a chance for us to all sit uh, silence a little bit and to gather ourselves. You know, Suli, I'm glad that you're 
feeling better. You mentioned COVID, and it's it's obviously been a crazy year and a half in the world um, in that way. And we've we've been asked to keep our distance. Yet what it's done mostly is to affirm our desire to be together, our desire to connect. And that's one thing that I felt time and time again from all of the combatants for peace. When things got hard, the desire to connect was even greater. And so to be united with people around the world who have joined in and recognized that this is not somebody else's problem or conflict or issue, it's all of ours. And to recognize that joint suffering um, is such an important aspect to the work the combatants does. And I think the brilliance of the coming together for this for memorial ceremony. Um, it was uh, as moving as as it's been in past years in being together. Again, I think because of that desire. Thank you, Steve. I can start by reading already some of the messages that you guys are starting to write. For instance, um, I think it's uh, Ariel maybe. Uh, from Germany. Mm. I'm overwhelmed. I watched the ceremony for the first time this year in a row. He's an Israeli guy living in Germany. Um, also, uh, Lia Rosen from uh, New York. I've met and learned from Combats for Peace in Israel, Palestine, and I'm moved by the stories everyone told. Thank you. I think the chat is now open to everybody. Correct me if I'm wrong, David. So uh, everyone could also see the chat and read. Um, but just in case, if, if, if some of you don't or can't, I will read one more. Um, we have Rebecca. Uh, I'm so moved, thank you. I'm a dual American Israeli citizen and for many years made the pilgrimage to Har Herzl for the Yom Zikaron ceremony. But even then I felt that that told only half of the story. I believe that each person is responsible to see the divine spark in each person. That small yet large step will mark the beginning of hope and progress. These are precious things you're writing guys. Um, and Maybe, uh, Steve, I can ask you to um, lo locate yourself for a minute in the history of, of Combats for Peace in the past few years. Can you uh, share how did you get to make the connection with Combats for Peace? What draw you to uh, work with us and to decide on producing a movie? Yeah. You know, uh, I had been invited to make a film uh, in the region to say something about the conflict. And my initial instinct was there was nothing new to say. And there was certainly nothing for me to say as an outsider, as somebody who lived in the United States. But I agreed to go over and I met with people in both societies all over the political spectrum. And I was convinced at the end that there really was nothing new to say until somebody introduced me to combatants for peace. And the two people I met first were Suli and Chem. And uh, I asked them what this organization really about. And Chem said, we're a community of people taking responsibility for our own creation. And Suleiman said, we're breaking the cycle of violence by breaking our own sense of victimhood, by taking responsibility for all that we've created. And it was those two ideas that motivated the film. And the film really was a way, not of telling a historical narrative, but creating an experience of transformation. Because what we saw in each of the men and women, each of the people, the, the individuals that we met in Combatants for Peace, was a transformational process that they went through, first within themselves, within their own families and communities, and ultimately, in the larger world and meeting each other. And it was a way to tell a universal story because it's the, the, the idea of being stuck in narratives of, who to, of, of who's the hero and who's the villain, who's the victim and who's the perpetrator 
is is not limited to the Middle East. But by telling the story in a place in which it's so profoundly uh, present was an opportunity to, to dive into these ideas. And what I learned was that not only um, were their lives enriched by each other, but I learned um, from you, Asaf, from you, Suleiman, from so many others, which was the sense of freedom that's possible when you transcend those narratives. And so that was the um, that was really the the great gift of of uh, working on this film. Thank you, and I uh, can invite all of you guys uh, here in the room uh, to start also writing any question that you also might have for uh, Stephen and and for Suli, um, and I'm. A, 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 Suli, can you hear me? I, I'm, I have a question also for you. I understand yes. that you um, uh, release a book today, as I said at the beginning, and it has, of course, something to do with the long journey that you also made as a member of Chromats for Peace and as a member of many other, uh, many other entities uh, and your struggle for peace. Do you want to say a few words about that, about your personal story? Uh, thank you, Asaf. So, uh, yeah, firstly, I, I have to say, like, uh, also for people that didn't watch the movie, Disturbing the Beast, um, I really uh, recommend you to see it. My personal story is there. Uh, and as you both said, it's not really uh, unique for uh, us individually, a few people in the movie. This is a universal story that can fit uh, humans in different communities around the world. Uh, and uh, my personal story, I, my background, I have been in Israeli jail for 10 years and a half since the age of 14. That's where I grew up basically, aside of my village, which is around Jerusalem, where I born, which is not, I'm not allowed now to live there or even to visit there, unfortunately. Uh, so like a lot of my like personal story and the people I encountered and inspired by actually in the book that released today by Bacon Press. Uh, uh, this is written mostly by an uh, American friend of mine, Brina. She's uh, the one right wrote the book, just to give the credit back. Uh, so I think uh, people can, uh, uh, maybe our hope is really to soften hearts of, of people from all sides, uh, because as we've been talking a lot, Steve and myself during the movie, we travel together and actually we usually agree in almost everything. So we have really like a soul connection. Uh, what we are talking about is really not just the Palestinian uh, Israeli uh, uh, conflict and how to solve this conflict, how to transform people. And that's what maybe Combatants for Peace represent is really a hopeful, inspiring group of people um, that shows um, that we can, we all can change. And this is what we use in Combatants for Peace as people that fought in the past. I fought the Israelis when I was 14. I tried to kill two Israelis. Uh, not to say that most of the people in Combatants for Peace, especially the founders, has been in, in the Israeli army or in the Palestinian resistance. Uh, and what we say, if we are able to change, since we used violence in our hands, everybody is able to change. Uh, and I believe this message is really can go across the world if we look at, especially during the Corona time, like in the United States, I look at the uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, the history of colonization, like in Africa and South America and everywhere. I think this is a good moment for us to think of our history and our past and to recognize the power dynamic and to recognize the trauma uh, that we went through personally and uh, as community. Myself, uh, I'm lucky one among the lucky ones, I would say more privileged, I have to say, 
compared to other uh, thousands of prisoners that were with me in jail, which is the normal for Palestinian youth, uh, unfortunately, uh, living under the occupation. So I have the privilege to like do, to meet what we call the other and to go through a lot of uh, changes and uh, transformation myself. Uh, where my personal journey and generally competence will be journey, I would say also in, in the book and in the movie, uh, Disturbing the Beast, it's very clear that we are talking about a new story. And in order to create this new story, to let this story born, we need really to recognize the history. I don't agree with people that say, let's forget the history and just look forward. I think we are part of a historical movement. So I personally feel it's really important to recognize the history, the generation and the current situation, the power dynamic and the system and uh, find a strategy uh, for systematic change to change the system that uh, set in the place to serve a certain percentage of the community, whether we talk about Palestinians, Israelis, or we talk about the global system. Um, and I feel having a lot of alliances here uh, across the world um, that really want to see different world. And we personally, as community, um, can serve as example and model. And we're still learning, of course. None of us is perfect. We have our weaknesses, our uh, human nature, I guess, and the culture that we're coming from, the narrative we are carrying. You know, I watched tonight, like a few of the speakers speaking about how they are speaking and not feeling uh, they're cheating their own community, their own people, their own homeland, their own narrative. This is very important. I've been in this for years when I was in jail, changing from us and them to us together to see to feel, to, uh, to hear, to give a space for the other side story. This is like a very deep work, a very spiritual deep work. And I invite us all maybe, as Steve uh, chose the name, Disturbing the Beast, to disturb our own beast. And as Richard Gere mentioned tonight, we just speak the same language that nonviolence is not an easy choice. It's like a uh, life mission and uh, strategy. It's not just even a strategy, mm -hmm. it's like a, a way of living. And it's harder than violence, I have to say from my practical experience. Yes, I remember, Suli, first of all, um, the book is a, is a spectacularly beautiful book. Right. And um, um, your courage and your clarity is, is always inspiring. So I recommend it highly right. to everybody. Um, you know, you talked about um, it being nonviolence being a hard path. And I remember uh, at the premiere of the film in Jerusalem, uh, we were joined by uh, members, uh, former enemy combatants in Northern Ireland. And they spoke about how the, the path is hard, it's lonely, and it's beautiful. Um, and the pain of, of it, uh, uh, Tamara from Washington, D.C. wrote in that she felt the ceremony was hard to witness, to witness the pain and to pull herself from the desire to distance from that pain. And I, that's understandable. And at the same time, it may be that the grieving is also a path to connection and a path to love and acceptance. And Sula, you mentioned the notion of disturbing the peace. And as everybody in combatants understood in the path of transformation and the path of acceptance of the other is the questioning of one's own narrative. It's where it always begins. And so the ability to disturb our peace is challenging and it can be painful, but it also can lead to a sense of connection um, that, um, that is greater than anything that we've known. And I think that's the, the beauty of the coming together uh, in this ceremony. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we will see the trailer for the movie in a, in a few minutes, maybe to uh, just put some pictures behind. Um, I, 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 I will read just a, a couple of more um, 
messages that people wrote and then maybe one of the questions uh, Agnes from Israel is saying I never really connected to memorial uh, ceremonies till I uh, participated in combat for peace in the forum ceremony two years ago it seems to me so clear that anyone in Israel in Palestine should have watched these kind of ceremonies to try and understand how close we are really uh, through pain and to bring some hope in the wheel of breaking the cycle of violence. Uh, our belief exactly, Agnes, thank you. Um, a question we have, um, we have several questions already. Uh, I will start with this from Tamara to you, Suleiman. Um, what advice do you, Suli, have for anyone who is reluctant to reach across to the other community for fear of reprisal from the anti-normalization people. What do we do with the fear of that? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tamar. Uh, so let, let, let's both the context. I, and Steve mentioned uh, Ireland, which we work with ex fighters there from both sides, actually. This was inspiring uh, uh, connection, actually. Uh, meeting the other side, and working with the enemy is not something like accepted in the mainstream of any conflicting community. It's not like specific for Palestinians and for Israeli Jews. So just to put the context here, I know the normalization or anti-normalization term, which is called Tatbi in Arabic, it's actually exists in South African struggle in the local language, exists in North Ireland and Cyprus and other, and other places. So somehow we need to obviously like meeting the stranger the other uh, uh, is carrying a lot of fear of losing the identity so i just want to maybe honestly highlight that the power dynamic between israelis and palestinians and i'm not comparing makes it much uh, harder for palestinian to reach the other side uh, out of weakness and fear and victimhood and, and many other reasons. And also the needs, I would say honestly, the needs of uh, Palestinian and Israelis, usually we talk about the needs in non violence communication as uh, all the humans have the same needs, but not always, as Marshall Rosenberg said, because, you know, the need of my mom is to get a bear made to go to her olive trees. The needs of Israeli living in Tel Aviv with all the privilege is very different. Like, of course, like Israelis want more, uh, I would say, recognition and security. And that's normal. For Palestinian, we are in the level of survival needs. So just to understand and maybe, yeah, accept that we are not uh, playing in the same place. And the first thing to be aware. Uh, beyond this, I think, uh, uh, knowing about the other by reading like all kinds of alternative media because we know also the media is an important part here reporting like things from different narratives and filtering so I think uh, the best way is really not to read about us by I would say not to read about the other by your own eyes uh, writers like uh, uh, you know there is a lot of Israelis that uh, uh, known as expert of Arab affairs. I usually follow these people because I speak Hebrew from jail time. And usually I feel they are not talking about us. They're talking about other people. So, and the other way around, because I, I do read both languages. I'm like privileged out of jail. So uh, I think reading alternative media is really important, especially using social media nowadays. It reduces the fear also. It doesn't need like physical efforts. And also there are some organizations, uh, Combatant Service is one of many that doing uh, alternative uh, political tours in normal days without Corona uh, to show like the real life uh, of the Palestinians, for example, and uh, the meetings that happen between both sides. You know, the Family Forum, our partners in the Memorial Day, they have a great project called the Narratives Project, which teach narratives of each side. I think this is a central essential like teaching to understand like where we coming from like both sides let's say for the sake of that uh, so there are a few steps 
to go with that. And usually I would say if the question, Tamar, I believe coming from more Israeli or Western like person, like just give the Palestinian to decide in our life. That's simple, like what's normalization, what's not, what's dangerous, what's accepted, what's not. I think uh, usually the Palestinian person can decide that. And this have to be approached by a lot of sensitivities from our Israeli like good intention friends. Okay, uh, thank you. I will try and share my screen now to show the trailer for Disturbing the Peace, your film, Stephen, and then I will have uh, a question for you. Just, just a second. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you, guys. David, I believe we don't have sound. No, we don't. So, David, maybe we will try it from my screen. Yeah, we don't have sound. So. Yeah, I know. Okay, let, let me just try for a second. I was four years old when we were attacked on Yom Kippur. I remember us running to the shelter in Tel Aviv. It's very concrete for a child. They want to kill us. And I really didn't understand why do they hate us so much? I was four years old when we were attacked on Yom Kippur. I remember us running to the shelter in Tel Aviv. It's very concrete for a child. They want to kill us. And I really didn't understand why do they hate us so much? Nasser Akhoui was a little bit older than me, he was about 14 years old. The Jewish people were able to kill us. I don't know how to do this in this moment. I was able to handle the situation. It was very difficult to be a fighter in the situation of the war of the war. I was able to do this in the situation. I was admitted into the most prestigious units in the Israeli army. I was extremely proud. I knew my father was proud. We find that we actually have something in common, that willingness to kill people. You don't know. Okay. Um, so uh, first I want to thank everybody for the patience. We have uh, a lot of technical 
challenges here. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, some of the people in the crowd asking what they can do from the outside, non-Israelis, non-Palestinians. And I want to ask you, as someone who came from the outside, despite your very deep a connection to uh, to Israel from your biography, from your personal story, still you're uh, coming from the outside and, and trying to do something with the people on, on the ground here. What are the challenges in doing that? Uh, how did you meet these challenges as an outsider in, in a sense? Yeah. Well, um, and there were a couple of questions in the chat exactly about that. Somebody from Montreal asked, how do you begin to, to take on these challenges within your own community? And the first thing is to understand that this is not a conflict that exists outside of our own reality. You know, one of the questions that, that, that came up very often as we traveled around the world with the film was, is this something that we should just leave alone to the Palestinians and Israelis? And it was very clear from, from both groups within combatants that, that this conflict was created in part by international powers through the Cold War and everything else. I mean, there's all kinds of geopolitics. The second thing to understand is that as Americans, we met with the chief procurement officer uh, for the US military who was stationed in Tel Aviv. And she told us that uh, of the $38 billion that was approved by the Congress, and, and this was in the last year of the Obama administration. So I'm taking it out of the politics of, of Trump or anything else. Um, there was a $38 billion approval and her job was to make sure that not $1 of that $38 billion ever left the United States. And defense companies in, in the United States have been very strategic about putting their operations all over the United States in every congressional district. So what you begin to understand is that there are economic interests at play to maintain an ongoing conflict. So we have to recognize that we all play a part in this. And uh, that's one of the first things is to recognize that this is not something that exists in isolation. It exists in a much broader context of which we're a part of it. The second thing is really to begin to look at one's own narrative one's own biography and to begin to do the really painful hard work of understanding where our narratives were created of the other. Uh, because they're there and they're deep rooted. I know for me, you know, I was involved in human rights work. Um, I had spent time um, in, in uh, the West Bank. Um, I had been in Gaza. Uh, yet when you begin to tell this story and I find myself in Tulkaram and Nablus in Ramallah, uh, all of a sudden you come into contact again with, the, with, with those, those pieces that you thought you had worked through. So this is a continuous process. As Suli said, the work never ends. And so, um, but it's the commitment to that that I think is the, is the second step, is the commitment to your own process of transformation. And then the third is something that I learned very much from Chen and from Combatants for Peace. And that is the notion of moving from being a spectator to being a spectator. To recognize that you are a part of the play and you don't have to play the role that was scripted for you based on where you were born or what family you were born into or what community you were born into. So you get to make those choices and take responsibility for what it is that you're creating. So I think those are some of the most important steps. And then the ability to take on your own community um, flows naturally from that. And the importance of is this, th th this is actually critically important, is that the idea is not to make enemies. The not idea is, is to not in fighting something to create the other. It's something I learned from combatants as well. Even in the course of the demonstrations and everything else, there's always an invitation to the military or to whoever's there to join whenever they can. And so it's having compassion for the narratives that somebody else is stuck in, but also being very clear about the world that you want to create. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so we are opening opening the chat now for everyone, uh, so uh, you guys can read the 
what some other friends wrote, uh, many, many uh, messages moving and important are written here and also some more questions are coming in. Um, Skip, Skip is asking, uh, I don't know where Skip is from. He's saying, other than the vital objective of crossing barriers between people to foster mutual understanding and adjust peace, do combatants for peace or parents soko have a strategy for structural change? A strategy for structural change to create justice. Uh, um, Suli, would you want to try yeah. and... So, uh, thank you. This is a, a important, actually, question that we are dealing with all the time. Uh, first of all, I want to recognize that there is no one group, uh, uh, activist group that alone that can make this change happen. So I believe, obviously, that the revolution had minority people at the same time, I think the organizations, the different activists, uh, groups, community has to cooperate with each other because there is no one strategy to make this change happen slowly or step by step. I think the Combatants for Peace is part of a big alliance called Alliance for Peace Building, which include like 120 organization called OLMAP. And we are part of another networks locally and um, internationally in order to uh, have more effect or impact of uh, our work. Because at the end of the day, like a small group of people are not, uh, is not enough really to, um, how I say, the system is very strong, as you know, with full of weapons and companies and money and well established. So uh, the question of best strategy to face that is like a huge deep uh, question. For us, we also, in Combatants for Peace, since uh, we started, we adopted some values, uh, mainly around joint nonviolence struggle uh, that enable Palestinians and Israelis to get to meet each other, to understand each other, and to struggle together against the darkness of the occupation and then to, to create a new reality. I would say that the Memorial Day ceremony that we watch tonight and every year is part of this creation of uh, a new reality. So, for example, we used to call it Alternative Memorial Day. In the last few years, like we changed it to the Palestinian-Israeli Joint Memorial Day. We don't call it alternative because it is part of the reality. So to draw this line, to draw these facts on reality and to keep the imagination happening, because I guess this kind of revolution like need a lot of imagination. Uh, and strategy on the ground, I believe there is a, a lot of uh, ways and strategies that uh, making this change happen. Uh, for example, tonight, one of the speaker mentioned that her kids study in hand-in-hand uh, uh, -hand school, which is uh, uh, teaching Arabic and Hebrew and the two narratives, for example. Uh, there are other organizations that focus on, you know, um, interfaith or different type of dialogue. I think there is no, is one strategy that can do the whole work that needs to be done, which is in a long, long journey, as Steve mentioned. Uh, in Combat and uh, aside of the Memorial Day, we have the Nakba ceremony next month. I invite you all to join us next month in May 15, which is the Palestinian Catastrophe Day. This is something new that Israelis and Palestinians will commemorate the Nakba together uh, with a new message of hope and recognizing also the past. Uh, through the year also, we do a lot of activities, uh, thousands of talks, lectures, usually one Palestinian, one Israeli, sharing our personal stories with all ki kind of communities here, uh, showing that there is another way. And also there is a direct action element, which is important because there is a solidarity action needed uh, to show solidarity and empathy with the Palestinians in Area C specifically, where people facing house demolition and checkpoints and land grab every day by extreme settlers and other, uh, uh, like uh, uh, hundreds of, uh, uh, of violation of human rights that happening in the occupied territory daily. So this also need a, a, a respond. I think there's always a conversation between responding to the daily things that happening 
and having a strategy for a few years, which we always evaluate in combatants for peace. We had uh, always uh, workshops and thinking and exchange ideas. We sometimes trained by Palestinian or by Israelis and sometimes by outsider. And we have our own experience uh, to create, I would say, different strategies of uh, challenging the system. And definitely we do this with other alliances, with other organizations. Um, I'm very optimistic despite the hopelessness that exists here, which is maybe the hardest thing to sell, is really to sell hope to people. That's maybe one of the hardest things. That's why I believe the existence even of some groups like Combatants for Bees, the Family Forum and other groups is centrally important to give hope to people because usually, <clears throat> let me say, most of our people, the only Israeli they know is the Israeli with a gun on the checkpoint or a settler. I think the activist type of Israelis, they are the one to humanize the Israelis in front of the eyes of Palestinians and the other way around in different ways. I'm not comparing here the power dynamic. Um, I also think we shouldn't control everything, like the strategy and the plan and how many thousands we touch, because the work we do, like it has a lot of emotions, trauma and soul. Like, I think it's really when we, for example, I did a lot of fundraising for Combatant Service, and when they ask us, like especially a German foundation, with my respect, to evaluate how many people that we change their mind, I'm not sure I believe in this strategy, because I think, change can happen in a meeting, can happen in some years. Uh, it takes, it's a journey, it's a challenging thing. And mainly for me, I think really opening the hearts of people is, is more important uh, than just changing like their opinion. And this happened gradually, like all the time. So sometimes, you know, we face challenges obviously, but I think uh, I've seen people like joining, you know, like, if I think about our strategies, which has evolved all the time, like I remember the first memorial day ceremonies, like we had 70 people, then we have 200 people, then we have uh, 500 people, the next year we have a thousand people. A year before Corona, which I can't remember now, even which year, I believe 2019, SF, was, uh, we had 9,000 people attending the ceremony in Tel Aviv. This is like a huge, for us when we start, compare when we were starting. And now we had uh, over 200,000 people watching on Zoom, <clears throat> also thanks to Corona. So I really see the changes that happening. I see people joining Combatants for Peace all the time. And I, uh, I'm i like full optimistic that uh, where we are right now, that we are talking about uh, us together, both Israelis, Palestinian, um, for many people, they will come to this uh, place slowly. I also want to say, uh, this is something that I learned from Suli, is, is that um, the process itself is the project. Mm. You know, that it's, it's, uh, it's not transactional of, if this will make a difference, I'm willing to do it. It's how do you want to live your life? How do you want to live your life as an expression of your own humanity? And that's one thing that I see over and over in the work that combatants does. And it's not easy work. I think that it's really important to recognize that. You know, there's, there's the work that's being done is actually in all of the interpersonal stuff. It's actually forming a community and a dynamic that is uh, what you, how you want to see the world. The world that you want to live in is what you're is what they're creating what you guys are creating at every moment that you're together and in everything you work on whether it's an event like memorial day or something much more um, much smaller or more mundane and so that notion of being committed to live in a way that is consistent with the world that you want to live in is actually is, is actually the the work itself thank you guys um, I think we'll, we're we're getting to the to the end of this hour, and I thought we after we finish we will leave this room open because I see people are chatting or trying to chat also with each other and invite people from uh, similar places to maybe interact. So we will leave this room open uh, at least for five or ten more minutes after we.
uh, we finish the session. And also uh, Steve put down in the chat, the link to the movie website uh, for you to see. And of course you're all uh, very invited, very much invited to visit uh, Combats for Peace and the Parent Circle on the website, on the Facebook page and uh, stay in touch with all of us. And just let me see if if I can just uh, make sure I don't skip uh, a question because it, these are keep coming in. Um, yeah. Um, There's a, there's interesting. Somebody made the comment that that uh, they think that each side needs to recognize that the other side legitimately feels threatened, even yeah. if they feel threatened themselves. And there's a there's a really important moment in the film, and it it can be overlooked, but it's during the Gaza War in 2014, 2015, and um, the it's it's not unlike Corona in the sense that everybody was being kept apart. There were events that were canceled because it was too dangerous to be together, um, but everybody was connecting th through Zoom. And Basam Aramim, uh, in that Zoom conversation, now this is somebody who, who lost his young daughter to to violence, to the cycle of violence, um, and it's commemorated in a book called *A Paragon* by Colin McCann. And he says in the middle of it, he says we don't need to compare the suffering, you know, it's, it's not that it's symmetrical in that way. But even with that, we need to recognize the fear that people sitting in a cafe in Tel Aviv have. That's a transcendent idea. Okay, thank you, Steve. I think these are very uh, uh, relevant and important uh, concluding words. Uh, Suli, if you also want, want in one sentence to, to uh, the Ramadan is, is, is uh, starting today, maybe you want to say uh, something regarding that. Yeah, yeah, today is the month of Ramadan. I, I have fatwa not to fast because of Corona, so that's a good side to have Corona, so you don't have to fast. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to say, like, thanking everybody here. I saw many friends here, so I'm really happy to be together again and uh, to be again with you, Steve. Um, mm -hmm. I learned a lot from you. And I, I just want to say that despite the challenges that we have, the darkness that we have, as a friend said, let's keep one leg in reality with all the complexes and we deal with the reality and one leg in the dream. And this is... Uh, really important always uh, when we go through hard times and depression, um, hopelessness, that some of us would keep this dream alive. And that's uh, where we are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Suli. Um, yeah, yeah, thank and thank you, you also, uh, Varda, who is the translator. And thank you, David, uh, very much for uh, the technical support. And thank all of you, uh, our uh, dear guests, for joining us tonight. Uh, please stay in touch uh, through the uh, internet, through the website and the Facebook page. And we're going to leave this room open till 11. Uh, and you guys are most welcome to connect uh, via the chat. And of course, Steve and Suli, I invite you to stay for a few minutes more I'm also staying. to... Sorry, Suli? I'm staying. I'm saying they can yeah, have yeah. a chat and coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asaf. Shukran. Good night. Thank you, Asaf. Thank you. I think, guys, there is no moderator now. So, Smail, uh, Ruti, Greta, you can open the mic and just shout. Don't worry. It's uh, no rules now. Right, Steve? Khalas. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Ah, uh, they can't unmute themselves. Uh.
Okay. Are we unmuted? Are we unmuted? We can all un unmute. Now you can all yes. unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still okay. watching you. <laughs> so late. It was too so late. late. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, you, you still so late. Suli, your book should be arriving on our doorstep any minute. It's due here by nine o'clock tonight. We can't wait to read it. Oh, thanks, Marlene. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> Can you remind me? Uh, parents, for the people who don't know. Can yeah. <laughs> you remind me of the title again, please? Uh, it's called In This Place Together. I put it in the chat. I put the link in the chat. Uh, what? In This Place Together. Okay. For now. Uh, I I wanted to, Suleiman, I, we are also friends on the Facebook and I've studied in the Arava Institute uh, with, uh, with Palestinians and I had like really strong uh, experience there. And uh, I just want, I don't know if it's to consult or to share, like I'm now facing difficulties because I'm living in Sderot with the Israelis, which have really different uh, uh, views than me. And, uh, I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling uh, lost, like that we are uh, really losing. And uh, I don't know what to do. I think, uh, I feel like I need hope. And this evening is nice, but, but still I'm doubt how, how is it relevant for the day-to-day -day life? You know, when I'm speaking with people, I'm feeling so extremist and they called me leftist and uh, what? <laughs> it's yeah, hard. You know, I, I've been there, like I know the environment in the South. So it's, uh, it's challenging. I think it's good that you're there actually. So people can listen to a new like, story, a new view actually. There is also a group of Palestinians in Gaza that you can connect with them. I'm happy to connect you with them. But not... I'm happy to connect with him too. Ah, oh, Smain. Oh, yeah. When is Baba, Habibi? I've told you a lot. Habibi. You can now ask your question because it was too uh, hard to like <laughs> Ah, Ruti, let Smain speak. Okay. Um, Smain, please. Go ahead. Uh, guys, we are we are here together to to learn, like to find um, different ways how to grow together, how to meet together, not to to be in this in this hard time, like to divide each others. We are we are here how to find more ways to bring us together. I know uh, I was my question. It was what what can I do as a Palestinian? to make other Israeli people more involved. In Ismail, uh, I just want Ismail, just to say the background, Ismail is ex-prisoner, like myself, like many people here. Uh, so he's like, if you were in jail, you got credit, like you are really Palestinian. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, where Ismail is sitting uh, with Greta and Ruti, sorry if I highlighted you without asking, uh, they used to live in a Palestinian-Israeli eco-community near Jericho, between Jericho and Dead Sea, called Ekumi. Some people mm -hmm. may be heard of it. And this is one of the people, these are one of the groups that try to find, um, let's say, a new community that really includes everyone, like, um, from all sides. And also to be aware of the environmental issues because I think we focus a lot on the conflict. We just forget to talk about the land, the air, the food, the, uh, the nature, the, I don't know, the mushroom kingdom, which Steve made uh, like part of a movie. Maybe he don't want to talk about it, but I think Steve, no rules now. You can speak about it since Asaf is not here. Uh, <laughs> I would really also promote that movie because it's, it's, it has a lot of solutions with it, but uh, I, Steve should talk about it, not me. I watch it twice. Uh, that can also, like, I'm trying to say, uh, we have to go back to the nature mm -hmm. and the earth, and the, like the experience of Okumi is really important here. Yeah. Yeah, actually, 
actually I try to find a way how to do it here and in New York and to invite like um, also um, Palestinian Israeli people to live together also as well here in, in, in New York or in US I don't know where but uh, it's um, uh, and uh, to to continue our our vision our same work and uh, and, and to, uh, to find ways how we can help do you want to ask a question? I also, I also think to know, to know that whatever it is that we're doing has ripples in ways in which we may never know. Like the work that went on at Ikome was amazing. It is. Amazing. And, and even if it doesn't exist physically now, like I still I have chills just thinking about it. The, the energy that went out from that place that all of the people who it touched brought out into the world, we, we won't know all of those things. Yeah, actually, I, I involved to Okumi like since 2012 until 2016. And it was uh, in, in a, a deep, a deep experience for me. And yeah, it, it, there is an exam in Arabic. We said, if you drink like in a place, if you drink little bit water, you will back to this place. This place, Okumi, this place like that. If you eat there or you drink little bit water there, you, you always you thinking to back there because there is in this place there is lots of love yeah. people just meet as people and, and accepting each other as a human being without identity without without to name us or to blame us just we listen to each others and then what happened to that community oh god that community the thing in the most harder thing it was in that community the land it's a palestinian land and we and at by under control the israeli army and the israeli army give the land to a settler and we were rent the land from the settler and we were pay like almost two thousand five hundred dollar each month for the settlers for the land i'm so sorry <sighs> Ismail, I, I want to address the question, the very important question you're asking regarding uh, what what should you or any Palestinian do in order to uh, uh, allow the Israeli heart to be more open. And I have two simple uh, suggestions. I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to say anything that's new to you. The first thing is is the most basic tool that we that we use in Combat for Peace and also in the forum the family forum circle and that's using your own personal story if if you feel that you are in the place that uh has transformed uh, negative emotions to positive ones or fear into hope etc it means that your personal story is very precious and will open a heart be it an israeli heart or any other heart but the the other th important thing I, I would like to say, and it's a thing of principle more, that I believe Palestinians should bring more Palestinians mm. to the table and Israelis should bring more Israelis to the table. And when I will bring other Israelis to the table, there you will be with your personal story. And when you will bring other Palestinians to the circle, to the tent, to the joint meeting, there will be uh, uh, my personal story to be told after you brought more Palestinians. This is a thing of principle that in Combat for Peace is very important, I think. Uh, I hear you and I understand you fully. Uh, the thing, the thing we are like mm -hmm. a Palestinian is struggling with now. <sighs> In this hard situation, most of the Palestinians, they, they lose hope. They lose hope for solution, for better life. Because, uh, and also, the, like, not just the, the occupation is, is, is their problem. Also, the Palestinian Authority, they don't, like, they don't, like, uh, offer a good, a better life for those people. And those people, they are now... Like a kmo, a kmo, I, 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 oh my goodness. <laughs> 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 Oh my gosh! Kilo, kilo, a tab, kilo, be, 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 
بين نارين بين تو تو فايرز يا ذا ميدل بين تو فايرز اند لايك ذا 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 لايك ذا بيبول ناو when you talk up like just if you start to talk about peace people they start to tell you i need to live i need i need just little bit of freedom i need i need to found food for my family mm-hmm. and my children yeah there is شو كنا بنحكي اولويات Uh, yeah, for sure it's it's right. it's it's it, it in some senses for sure it's it's more complex and more challenging for Palestinians to uh, do this kind of political movement and of course uh, Soli knows that on his flesh how hard it is to really yeah. mobilize a lot of Palestinians um, but it is something that we see in our own eyes happening. Uh, combats for peace is on the ground for uh, 16 years the family circle for around 20 years and it's growing larger and larger each year and so today this evening with us were also a, a lot of palestinians online i yeah. I, i should believe i should assume, assume so yeah but th- these are very important questions you're raising and, and there will always feel difficult yeah i understand but- in any way in any way We have one solution. The only solution what we have to accept each other and to live together. There is no other solution. There is no other solution. And we should, like I know it's our, our, our work, it's like, a, it's, it's more harder, but we should to throw the experience, this experience and to, to, to like to go in the, um, in, in the middle of the dark, this dark, to light either small candle to give people more hope. I, I feel that also today in the Israeli atmosphere, it's also very hard to make change. Like people are very ignorant and, and like, they, like they, we don't feel the conflict in the day-to-day life. So people are kind of, Yeah, and he also, like, ah, we gave them Gaza and look what happened there. So what will happen if we will bring them the West Bank? And then, yeah, and, he, and then uh, they can't, uh, like, they, they don't open. They are so close to their uh, thoughts. I feel it's, it's also, it's not easy. It's not easy to be a leftist in Israel today. I would like to speak to America and what I'm dealing with in my neighborhood where the people do not remove their Trump signs. And, and, um, and my elected officials are still believing the lie. And they're in over 43 states, they are doing voter suppression laws. And they think they're doing the right thing. They think that the election was stolen and they're, they're doing this for justice. So you do have a hard time ahead of you and I feel your pain because I have a hard time. I've been dealing with no answer. You know, I write letters, I call and they really, If you're not a Trump supporter, they're not really responding to you. Can I ask a question? Could I say something about this specific this topic about a Trump supporter? Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's um, okay. Yeah. You know, every person, every human being in Mother Earth, he thinks fully he's right. We have a right. And how we get to this position, you know, we have a media always 24 hours like a factory working to create people in their way. What we need, some people, they have little dusk 
in, 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 in like in their eyes or in their heart. Just they, they need someone just to do like this, like this. <laughs> and will found a white heart, you will found a good human being. Every human, there is no human being bad. There is a situation like there is some, some experience that a human being is through to make him to do something bad. And just we need to communicate, to communicate more communication with those people and to talk but with them. With the Trump people? Either with, with the Trump people. We should, we cannot <laughs> say, hey, I don't want to talk with you. We, we should to talk with those people and to show him, to show them we are working for better, for better life for them. We are working for their future, for their children's future. We are working for better uh, humanity for everyone, for better Mother Earth, for, for to save Mother Earth, to save ourselves, to save our generation. Seth, I think we had uh, like a, a, a Zoom for all the team now to say thank you in our uh, last Zoom, right? So maybe... Uh, oh. We should let Edwin talk. He had a question. Uh, thank you. I, I don't know. There's so many people here. I didn't think uh, I can get a you know a chance, but thank you. So my question is for Suli. Suli, I don't know if you remember. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe a year and a half ago, we met at your own official office in uh, Betzalel, Shmona Betzalel, and um, we were scheming together. So uh, my my personal mission and profession is taking groups of uh, students, high school students and educators uh, over there to Israel and Palestine and try and engineer uh, a, a way, a workable, if not not ideal, but a workable uh, arrangement um, for, for peace. Um, and uh, just as we were scheming our plans uh, and we we're ready to go, then comes COVID and um, and so we're grounded. And my question to you is, and anyone else who wants to chime in, um, are all, is, <laughs> are places in Israel and in Palestine open to visit and take groups around? Or, um, or are we doing this, because uh, we tried to do a virtual reality, just does not work. Um, is the theater open for business, so to speak? I'm gonna, so the, I'm gonna let you answer that. And um, I, I just wanted to say one quick thing because unfortunately I have to go, um, but I wanted to thank everybody for being here. And it struck me that, you know, the conversation that we're having is, a, is clearly a global conversation from things going on in the United States to, uh, to all over the world. We just um, showed the film, actually the film's being used in Hong Kong for, <laughs> for people to talk about the political divide that's happening there that's tearing families apart. So this exists everywhere. And I think that I think that the one thing that I would offer to everybody who's talking about Trump and all this other stuff is, is that the first place to return to is a place of curiosity and to really understand why it makes sense. Because I agree that people weren't born with, with these ideologies, were acculturated into it. So to understand why it makes sense, um, the truth is that there has been you know, a, there have been a great deal of people left behind um, in the United States, and I felt that the government betrayed them, left them behind. Like to understand how do you get to that place without demonizing anybody, recognizing that everything makes sense, right? And so it's that curiosity. To, the kind of curiosity, not just of trying to figure it out, but the curiosity that suspends any judgment, that allows us to understand how these things work, to understand the patterns, to gain a level of awareness, and then to accept our responsibility for what we do to perpetuate it. You know, I'll say something about Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump came to power at a time where, where what we privileged in the United States was consumerism, misogyny, wealth, and he was a reflection of the society in many ways that we created and that we, you know, so it's on us as well to look at the places in which we help to create that possibility. And then what do we want to do to bridge those divides um, without creating the other? So um, I, I leave you with that as a way of, of 
frankly, of of memorializing all of the suffering that's gone on from uh, in the region and around the world um, from those divides that we tend to create. Um, and uh, as we said before, the first, and we traveled all over the world with this film for years. We continue to, Suli knows, at every Q&A, the first question, one of the last questions we would ask is, um, if, if the notion of disturbing the peace is the way out, whose peace do we need to disturb first? And all around the world, they answered, mm. our own. Our own. Mm -hmm. So that's the way of honoring the suffering of others, um, is to first disturb our own peace. And um, with that, I, I thank everybody for being a part of this. Um, Asaf, Suli, uh, you, love, and um, we'll talk soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And if anybody wants to reach out, you can get us through, uh, through the website at disturbingthepeacefilm.com. I'm happy to continue the conversation. Thank and read you. Suli's book. Talk to all of you. Yeah. Suli, look what just arrived. <laughs> oh. Your mom and dad just the room is about to be shut down, people, so please... Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Bye -bye.